the Marine Expeditionary Force has uh, uh, contained within it, within that command structure, uh, the 1st Marine Division, 1st uh, Marine Air Wing, and all of the logistics that goes with that. So it's a, it's a big unit. Subsequently, I received the 2nd Marine Division as part of that command. So by the time they had finished sending troops to me, I, I had most of the Marine Corps. There were about 92,000 people in the command. At any rate, went to Riyadh, began to try to untangle uh, or get a better understanding of what was going on, began to deploy the Marine forces as they came in, uh, which is a, an interesting story, but not necessarily, necessarily pertinent to our conversation today. But to make a long story short, we, we brought all of those Marines in, into Saudi Arabia. Uh, initially, we were on the defense because we thought that Saddam Hussein would certainly follow up that attack into Kuwait down into Saudi Arabia. And if you recall what that country looks like, most of the oil, oil refineries, oil infrastructure is on the east coast of Saudi Arabia. All he had to do was come on down, carve that portion out, and he controlled a huge amount of the world's oil. A huge amount. So we initially deployed in the, de in the defense. Uh, as time went on, it became pretty apparent that he had missed his chance. Um, our strength increased day by day uh, to the point that I knew that he would not be successful if he came down. So then we began to transfer our thought process and our planning to the offense. Um, we had several, several things to, to think about, more than several, but the, the, the critical pieces were um, how, do we, how do we attack Kuwait and our, my mission, our mission was, in, in a couple of words, was to liberate Kuwait, liberate the country. The army was coming around, as you recall, from the west in what became known as the Big Left Hook, or whatever we called it. Uh, our job was to attack into Kuwait and liberate that country. So we were faced with a significant barrier that they had put up, that the Iraqis had put up, significant minefields, other obstacles that they had had uh, deployed along the border of Kuwait and Saudi Arabia. So number one, how do we how do we break through those barriers quickly? And then, sort of as cover for that, for them, chemical weapons. Now we knew they had them. So where we were most vulnerable was as we attacked through these barriers, cut through these barriers. Um, and it wasn't going to be real fast. It wasn't going to be slow, but it wasn't going to be real fast. We were vulnerable to chemical attack and were very concerned about whether or not they would drop them on us. So we attacked into Kuwait with chemical suits on. Our air wings uh, had done a magnificent job of weakening that Iraqi army. They were demoralized and, uh, and weakened rather dramatically. But at any rate, we cut through, those, cut through those minefields and those barriers really quickly. And uh, that is a real credit to the Marines. This, I'm, I'm making it sound as if it, wasn't, if it was easy. It was not. We trained for weeks and weeks and weeks on how to, how to get across those minefields, although it, it ran from the coast of Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, all the way across uh, out into the western desert. I mean, it was a considerable engineering feat on their part. And as we watched this unfold, uh, we were impressed that they were able to do it. And they did it pretty quickly. Uh, the minefields could be uh, 30 to 50 yards wide containing anti-tank and anti-personnel mines. So 
it, it wasn't an easy feat to, to get across them, uh, particularly since we were worried about uh, chemical weapons. At any rate, uh, we attacked into, into Kuwait, the Marines did, a multi-division attack, and, and were successful. You know, in three days, we had liberated the country. But uh, the planning was, was detailed and significant. I, I formed a small command post, mobile command post, and pulled right up behind the 2nd Marine Division, so I was into Kuwait right behind them. Um, for me, that's the way you fight. Uh, I, I can't, uh, I'm not a believer in staying behind in your headquarters 50 miles to the rear and trying to discern what's going on on the front lines. Now that doesn't mean you should be doing anything stupid either because you don't want them to capture or kill the commanding general, but on the other hand there is a trade-off there. So I took the command post uh, into Kuwait right behind the 2nd Marine Division so I knew what was going on and, uh, and we were successful. I thought then and I continue to believe now that about 25% of them wanted to fight and about 75% of them gave up. Um, now when 75% of them want to give up that's, that's a good thing but it causes for a, a very uh, confused situation on the ground for the young Marine. When 25% want to fight, the others are trying to give up. Some are shooting at him, some are not shooting at him. Some are coming say, take me. Um, I think to their great, great credit, I, I am not aware, I'm not aware of a single atrocity that was committed during that time period. And it was right for that. Somebody's shooting here, somebody's trying to give up here, just kill them both. These guys didn't do that. We captured 22,000 Iraqi prisoners, sent them to the rear, turned them over to the Saudis. I have no idea how many we killed. Uh, we didn't, didn't count, weren't interested in counting. All we were interested in doing was liberating Kuwait, which we did.